You're watching BBC News from Live. It is 11 a.m. These are the main stories this morning. Robert Mugabe, who led Zimbabwe for nearly four decades after independence, has died aged 95. He secured black majority rule for his country in 1980, but his presidency was marred by economic collapse and human rights abuses. You are some, uh, someone who was a man of his words. You could do the right thing. Although in some things, he did the things not in a, in a, in a, in a good way. Good morning. Welcome to BBC News from Live. I'm Carrie Gracie. The former president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, has died at the age of 95. Mugabe was at the center of his country's struggle for independence from Britain and became its first prime minister in 1980 before serving as president seven years later. His reputation as a hero of the independence movement was soon overshadowed by the brutality of his rule. In the early 1980s, thousands of people were massacred and tortured in Matabililand, and the suppression of human rights became a defining feature of his time in power. But for many Africans, he remains an icon of liberation from white rule. Shingai Nioka looks back at his life. He was once Zimbabwe's liberator, leading a war against white minority rule. But by the end, the adulation President Robert Mugabe once enjoyed was gone. He cemented his power, winning overwhelmingly at elections in 1980. As leader of a new nation, he set about creating a better country than the one he inherited. And for a while, he succeeded. There can never be any return to the state of armed conflict which existed before our commitment to peace and the democratic process of the election under the Lancaster House Agreement. Surely, this is now time to beat our swords into plowshares. But beneath the veneer lay a dark side. Mr. Mgabe deployed a crack military unit to southern Zimbabwe to deal with hundreds of insurgents. Between 1983 and 1987, thousands were murdered and the world turned a blind eye. Mugabe was the great hope. But as the 1990s ended, the economy was bottoming out and a new political party was on the rise. Seemingly desperate to regain popularity, Mr. Mugabe played a political hand. Land seized by the colonial government was still in the hands of the white minority. Sensing the frustration, Mugabe encouraged blacks to take back their land, and they did, often violently. The Western world took note, breaking diplomatic ties and imposing economic sanctions. The opposition, its leaders, human rights workers bore the brunt of his anger. In 2008, in the midst of billion percent inflation and widespread unemployment, Mr. Mugabe suffered his first electoral defeat. It only led to more violence in the second round of voting. Britain stripped him of his knighthood and former allies condemned him. Nearer to home, we had seen the outbreak of violence against fellow Africans in our own country and the tragic failure of leadership in our neighboring Zimbabwe. But he remained a cult-like figure among many Africans for daring to challenge Western political dominance on the world's affairs. In retaliation for the measures we took to empower the black majority, the United Kingdom has mobilized uh, friends and allies in Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand to impose illegal economic sanctions against Zimbabwe. But within his own party, discontent was rising. Many believed he had overstayed and needed to hand over power. His second wife, Grace Mugabe, 40 years his junior, seemed to be gaining power, and she began accusing then-Vice President Emerson Mnangagwa of trying to oust them. Mr. Mugabe finally fired his longtime aide, accusing him of trying to topple him. 
Mr. Mnangagwa, with the help of the military, mounted a comeback, posting soldiers on the streets and placing Mr. Mugabe under house arrest. Tens of thousands of Zimbabweans marched, calling on him to step down. And after the threat of impeachment, he resigned. In his last years, Mr. Mugabe had retreated to the seclusion of his mansion. Many will remember him as a gifted orator and visionary who liberated Zimbabwe, but later returned her to the shackles of oppression. Well, Robert Mugabe died in Singapore, where he'd been receiving medical treatment. Our correspondent there, Krishma Vaswani, sent this update. I'm standing in front of the funeral parlor in Singapore where the body of the former leader of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, is. The BBC can confirm that his body is being placed on the second floor in one of the more premium suites in the building. I've been out to the back of the building where I've seen some vehicles. It's thought that, that uh, those vehicles will be how uh, his body gets transported to the airport. And it, indeed, it does leave the country. It would be from this funeral parlor. It's been pretty quiet here earlier on at the hospital where it's thought uh, Mr. Mugabe had received treatment for several months in Singapore. It was also very quiet, a reflection of just how low-key perhaps the Singapore government wants to keep this death at this point in time. Mr. Mugabe had been visiting Singapore and was frequently spotted here for several years now and he had other links here too. His daughter, one of his four children, had graduated from a university here and he was seen photographed at that graduation. There hasn't been much information from the Sim Singapore government at this point in time, but that may be because of the high profile nature of his death and what an international figure he was in politics, notwithstanding the complicated legacy he's left behind. Karishma Vaswani. Well, let's get reaction from Zimbabwe now. And uh, people in Harare have been giving their thoughts on Robert Mugabe's time in office. He was some, uh, someone who was a man of his words. He could do the right thing. Although in some things, he did the things not in a, in a, in a, in a good way. Like the land reform program, uh, to me it, was, it wasn't a good thing. This is uh, sad news. We lost a good father. Mugabe was all right. But this Mnangagwa is not all right. Yeah. It's not all right. We, I, I tell you the truth. Mnangagwa is not all right. But Mugabe was a good father to us. Yeah. Well, let's hear the thoughts now of our correspondent in Harawi. Uh, which uh, today is Shingai Nyoka. Well, I'm in the central business district um, where all the commerce takes place, but you wouldn't think that uh, such an important figure in Zimbabwe's history has died. Many people are going about uh, their ordinary chores, their day-to-day -day chores, um, selling their wares on the streets and walking around. And I think it speaks to the fact that um, by the time that he had died, which is uh, early in the early hours of this morning, uh, Robert Mugabe had already become a historic figure. And he's been out of power for two years. Uh, but there has been some discussion about the kind of legacy that he leaves behind and many people would agree that it's a checkered history. Um, some are conflicted. Uh, he was Zimbabwe's liberator. Emerson Mnangagwa called him a founding father of Zimbabwe, but uh, the repression uh, is difficult to run away from, and the fact that he had to be ousted from office after taking Zimbabwe from a prosperous nation to, to one that was full of hunger uh, with an unemployment rate of 80%. Well, let's hear the view of a business person in Zimbabwe now. Basusi Moyo is CEO of the largest cooking oil manufacturer in Zimbabwe, which is inspired by Skype from Bulawayo in the south of the country. Thank you so much for talking to us. What are Thank your you, Kelly. What are your feelings today on the death of the former president? Well, a lot of mixed feelings, uh, Kerry. Um, you know, it's a sweet and sour, a bit of a roller coaster uh, in terms of uh, the thoughts and reflections around uh, the late former president. I think there are two parts to him. There was the earlier Mugabe that we knew who was loved, um, who was an eloquent man, internationally engaged, uh, seen as a liberator for all intents and purposes. That was the, the early Mugabe that we knew. And then there's the later Mugabe, part B of the story was that was 
a little bit more controversial and very difficult uh, to understand how such a great man could, could end up leaving a legacy that is so mixed in, in so many ways. And we've heard various people try to explain that. What is your explanation and what do you think is the explanation that, that works for most Zimbabweans, if there is any consensus on the issue? Well, I think, you know, in my mind, so as I reflect, I think if uh, the late president had been a two-term president, he would have gone down in history along with the likes of Nelson Mandela. Um, I think it was a case of just over having, just having overstayed. I think that was the, the main challenge. And we saw the transition. That was an undesirable. I think it could have been avoided. And the legacy would have been completely different from what we are talking about today. That's fascinating. So it's one of those situations where power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, that kind of thought. I mean, it makes me think of China, where, of course, Chairman Mao, similarly a liberation figure, um, hugely revered, uh, but perhaps overstayed his welcome. These things perhaps are universal. I think that, uh, that that is an interesting parallel, and uh, I think it's it's similar in this instance. Uh, I think the later years, the economy, um, you know, as a business person, the economy became subordinated, and, and there's a lot of economic suffering. We have a huge diaspora that is out there because of the economic suffering. He presided over uh, rampant inflation that went into the billions. So this this was unfortunately a dark cloud over this legacy, um, among other things. Uh, but also a lot of things that people like me um, who went to uh, schools that were, we read Tom Brown's school days because thanks, of, thanks to his legacy of uh, supporting an education system that was the envy of Southern Africa for many years. So a lot of good things were done in the early foundational years uh, after the liberation, except for some of the you know, the things that happened in the South. Besides that, really from an economy point of view, from building a foundation, a vibrant society, he, he, he did very well. But the later years were very clouded and mixed and very difficult um, to work in as a business person. Okay, well, I want to ask you about that now because some of those economic problems, of course, we hear about in Zimbabwe today. Some people are as critical of the current president or even more critical of the current government of Zimbabwe. How is it for you uh, trying to run a business there now as you are trying? Well, the environment has remained challenging. So the legacy, part of the legacy and the overhang is that, you know, the, the, the former president did leave a huge amount of debt um, and economic problems that will take some time to rectify and to fix, to move to a market economy, as opposed to what we had, a centrally planned economy um, and the like, uh, that still followed very statist sort of principles. Um, we are trying to help as private sector. We belong to business member organization. I'm the former president of the Confederation of Zimbabwe Industries and other business organization to try and make an input to how we transition to a market-based economy. There are lots of legacy issues, lots of challenges, uh, both internal and external, um, that will require a lot of support and a lot of hard work um, as, as, as we dig ourselves out of the hole that we're in. Well, it's been fascinating hearing your reflections. Basisa Moe, thanks so much for joining us. Now we're going to go back to our top story, the death of Robert Mugabe, the former president of Zimbabwe, who the country's and the country's first post-colonial leader. He has died aged 95. And now let's talk to Peter Longworth, who was British High Commissioner to Zimbabwe from 1998 to 2001 and joins us in the studio. Peter, thanks for coming in. So you knew Robert Mugabe. Tell me what you made of him as a person. Well, he was... Um a surprisingly charming person, or could be, but he got a short fuse. So I personally always had a good working relationship with him until things got so bad uh, in his uh, abuse of the United Kingdom as a scapegoat for his own problems that um, really um, our communication stopped. So you were in Zimbabwe in the, in the latter stages of your role as High Commissioner without having communication with the President? Well, when I say without having, I mean, we spoke from time to time, but um, uh, in the first sort of half of my tour there, we had a, a relatively civilized relationship. So 
I'm interested in, um, and I know many viewers are, in what exactly went wrong. Because if you're old enough to remember uh, Zimbabwe at the beginning of the Mugabe era, there's such high hopes for what it was going to be. It was a, a, a rich country in many ways. What went wrong economically? Well, I think uh, if there is a tragedy about Mugabe's death, it's that he didn't die when he was 73 instead of 95. Because Which is quite a bracing way of putting it, but yeah, I but know what you mean. It's, it, it, at that particular point, and it was just before I arrived in Zimbabwe, I, he was still quite a revered person internationally. I mean, he would have gone down with Mandela and, 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 uh, and these kind of uh, special African heroes, but... Um, it started really going down the tube towards the end of uh, 1997 when he was confronted with strong demands for money from his Veterans Association. Uh, and he shifted tack completely, said that he'd pay them large amounts of money and the funding would come from the nationalisation of, the, uh, of these white-owned farms. Um, that drove the Zimbabwe dollar down, it created the usual rapid uh, currency shortfall problems in terms of uh, unemployment, inflation. Um, it actually gave the impetus to the then leader of the trade union movement to launch a new opposition party. It was quite unthought of in Zimbabwe uh, and indeed in the rest of southern Africa because you know, who is this guy to challenge the liberation movement? But it was at that point uh, that, if you like, Mugabe just sort of let the whole thing rip and, um, uh, and, and allowed uh, the... Um, well, actually, not only allowed, but encouraged the takeover of white farms in, in a particularly violent and uh, difficult way. And do you think there would have been a, a better way of achieving the same objective? Because, of course, you know, many people will think about the way Zimbabwe was in the colonial era. You've got mm. a lot of vested interests. You've got yeah. a lot of white privilege. You know, I mean, all these black liberation figures struggled with the same problem in a way, didn't they? And it's not yeah. even been successfully handled, I suppose, some South Africans would say, there, even with the, the, the saintly Mandela in charge. It's quite difficult to transition these economies away from that, that kind of privilege. No, but he was very successful in, in running an economy from uh, the time he came in and uh, what was it, the year 2000 was independent, uh, sorry, 1980 was independence. Um, and when I got there in um, early 1998, uh, having just served a spell in Johannesburg, I mean, it was quite remarkable uh, what a change I saw in terms of easy life on the streets, well-run economy, policemen so arresting criminals. So he had a success which he threw away? Yeah. And he threw away because um, I think at heart he was a strong Africanist, that he never really was a, a compromised person, but it suited him to have his economy going the way it did. And it suited him to be, you know, a, a big man on the world stage. Peter Long, we're going to have to leave it there, but it's been fascinating um, to look at your recollections of being there at a time when so much was on the change in Zimbabwe under yep. Mugabe. Thanks so much for coming in. Yep. The former president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, has died at the age of 95. Mugabe was at the centre of his country's struggle for independence from Britain and became its first prime minister in 1980 before serving as president seven years later. His reputation as a hero of the independence movement was soon overshadowed by the brutality of his rule. In the early 1980s, thousands of people were massacred and tortured in Matabililand and the suppression of human rights became a defining feature of his time in power. But for many Africans, he still remains an icon of liberation from white rule. Shingai Nioka looks back now at his life. He was once Zimbabwe's liberator, leading a war against white minority rule. But by the end, the adulation President Robert Mugabe once enjoyed was gone. He cemented his power, winning overwhelmingly at elections in 1980. As leader of a new nation, he set about creating a better country than the one he inherited. And for a while, he succeeded. 
there can never be any return to the state of armed conflict which existed before our commitment to peace and the democratic process of election under the Lancaster House Agreement. Surely, this is now time to beat our swords into plowshares. But beneath the veneer lay a dark side. Mr. Mgabe deployed a crack military unit to southern Zimbabwe to deal with hundreds of insurgents. Between 1983 and 1987, thousands were murdered and the world turned a blind eye. Mugabe was the great hope. But as the 1990s ended, the economy was bottoming out and a new political party was on the rise. Seemingly desperate to regain popularity, Mr. Mugabe played a political hand. Land seized by the colonial government was still in the hands of the white minority. Sensing the frustration, Mugabe encouraged blacks to take back their land, and they did, often violently. The Western world took note, breaking diplomatic ties and imposing economic sanctions. The opposition, its leaders, human rights workers bore the brunt of his anger. In 2008, in the midst of billion percent inflation and widespread unemployment, Mr. Mugabe suffered his first electoral defeat. It only led to more violence in the second round of voting. Britain stripped him of his knighthood and former allies condemned him. Nearer to home, we had seen the outbreak of violence against fellow Africans in our own country and the tragic failure of leadership in our neighboring Zimbabwe. But he remained a cult-like figure among many Africans for daring to challenge Western political dominance on the world's affairs. In retaliation for the measures we took to empower the black majority, the United Kingdom has mobilized uh, friends and allies in Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand to impose illegal economic sanctions against Zimbabwe. But within his own party, discontent was rising. Many believed he had overstayed and needed to hand over power. His second wife, Grace Mugabe, 40 years his junior, seemed to be gaining power, and she began accusing then-Vice President Emerson Mnangagwa of trying to oust them. Mr. Mugabe finally fired his longtime aide, accusing him of trying to topple him. Mr. Mnangagwa, with the help of the military, mounted a comeback, posting soldiers on the streets and placing Mr. Mugabe under house arrest. Tens of thousands of Zimbabweans marched, calling on him to step down. And after the threat of impeachment, he resigned. In his last years, Mr. Mugabe had retreated to the seclusion of his mansion. Many will remember him as a gifted orator and visionary who liberated Zimbabwe, but later returned her to the shackles of oppression. Maki. Now, more on the death of Robert Mugabe, the former president of Zimbabwe who, and the country's first post-colonial leader who has died aged 94. Let's, uh, 95, sorry. Let's talk now to human rights campaigner Peter Tatchell, who once attempted a citizen's arrest on Mr Mugabe in London. Peter Tatchell, thanks so much for coming in. We'll talk about that in a moment, but I want to talk, you've got such an interesting history in relation to Zimbabwe and in relation to... Mugabe himself, going back so far. I mean, you started in the 1970s as an admirer of his liberation struggle. That's right. And as a student, I helped fundraise to buy medical kits for people living in the liberated areas. Um, you know, I saw Mugabe as being, you know, a just fighter for majority rule at a time when most black Zimbabweans could not vote. There was widespread institutional discrimination. He had a just cause. And I've got a copy of uh, his political program in 1974, and no one could disagree with it. He what stood, even today? Yeah, he, he stood for, you know, democratic fair elections, free press, the right to protest, all the basic human rights. Yet, so sadly and so tragically, uh, this man who began as a liberation hero became a tyrant. You know, he, so killed, he killed more black Africans than even the evil apartheid, regi uh, even the evil apartheid regime in South Africa. In, in Matabiriland, it's estimated he killed about 20,000 
opposition supporters. That's the equivalent of a Sharpeville massacre every day for nine months. Well, when you put it like that, that is an incredible... Um, I mean, it, it's, it's astonishing to think that one man could, could, have, could have done that and, and come from the adulation that he came from. So, so talk about then, for our viewers, your journey from admirer um, to sceptic to worse. Well, I think the thing that really made me into a critic and a sceptic was, of course, those massacres in Matabililand. Um, you know, that was a clear example where he was seeking to liquidate the opposition and supporters um, and aggrandize power completely against the democratic ethos on which he fought the liberation war. Uh, and then, of course, later he began to you know, oppress and, and victimize trade unionists, um, liberals, progressives, lawyers, students, gay people, and many others. Uh, he, he, he became <laughs> everything that he once fought against. And um, you met him, I think, in the mid-90s. Tell us about what happened there. Yeah, I met him at the Africa 40 conference in London in 1997. And um, uh, I mentioned to him that well, as a student, I'd help fundraise to buy medical kits for his forces in the liberated areas. He thanked me and said, thanks to people like you, we, we, we won our freedom. And then he said, um, by the way, what are you doing now? And I said, among other things, I campaign for gay rights. He was drinking a cup of tea at the time, and he spluttered his tea everywhere, uh, and then quickly summoned security people to have him, have him removed. Because he's notoriously homophobic. Yeah. And it's very, very strange, because, um, you know, what drives a person to be so obsessed with homosexuality? Um, maybe it's partly his very traditional Catholic upbringing. Maybe I think he also saw the LGBT plus community as a useful scapegoat, a bit like Hitler scapegoat of the Jewish people. Um, Mugabe saw LGBT people as a way of demonizing a minority within the country to turn focus away from the failings of his own regime. It's a fascinating conversation. I, ha I, I can't end it without talking about your attempt to arrest him, citizens arrested in two years later in 1999. Tell us. Well, that was in London and then again in 2001 in Brussels. And in the second attempt, I was beaten unconscious by his bodyguards and ended up with some brain and eye damage. But of course, nothing by comparison to the horrific injuries and even death that he inflicted upon black and white Zimbabweans. And so how do you see him now today at the point when 95 years old, um, he dies, uh, a very complex legacy? And we've heard some black Africans today reflecting on that, the kind of things that they admired, the things that they revered, things they still cherish about his, about his life and his journey, and yet, and yet, all the other things. How does well, it balance for you? Well, he did ensure that black Zimbabweans had the right to vote, that institutional discrimination was removed, there was huge investment to improve the health and education system to benefit the poor, although sadly now, because of his economic incompetence, uh, those services are much diminished. But overall, I think we can say that he was a liberation hero turned tyrant. And sadly, his legacy is now much besmirched by the terrible repression he visited on his own people in the name of so-called emancipating them. Peter Tatchell, thanks so much. We could talk about this for much, much longer, but we've got to move on. He was the liberation hero who became a ruthless dictator. Robert Mugabe, the former president of Zimbabwe, has died at the age of 95. Mr Mugabe led the independence war against white minority rule and then ruled the country for 37 years. His regime was one of brutal repression and economic mismanagement, which brought Zimbabwe to its knees. He was finally overthrown in a coup and has now died in hospital in Singapore. A warning that this report from our correspondent in Zimbabwe, Shinga Nyoka, contains flash photography. He was once Zimbabwe's liberator, leading a war against white minority rule. But by the end, the adulation President Robert Mugabe once enjoyed was gone. He cemented his power, winning overwhelmingly at elections in 1980. As leader of a new nation, he set about creating a better country than the one he inherited. And for a while, he succeeded. There can never be any return to the state of armed conflict which existed before our commitment to peace and the democratic process of election under the Lancaster House Agreement. Surely, this is now time to beat our swords into plowshares. 
But beneath the veneer lay a dark side. Mr. Mgabe deployed a crack military unit to southern Zimbabwe to deal with hundreds of insurgents. Between 1983 and 1987, thousands were murdered and the world turned a blind eye. Mugabe was the great hope. But as the 1990s ended, the economy was bottoming out and a new political party was on the rise. Seemingly desperate to regain popularity, Mr. Mugabe played a political hand. Land seized by the colonial government was still in the hands of the white minority. Sensing the frustration, Mugabe encouraged blacks to take back their land, and they did, often violently. The Western world took note, breaking diplomatic ties and imposing economic sanctions. The opposition, its leaders, human rights workers bore the brunt of his anger. In 2008, in the midst of billion percent inflation and widespread unemployment, Mr. Mugabe suffered his first electoral defeat. It only led to more violence in the second round of voting. Britain stripped him of his knighthood and former allies condemned him. Nearer to home, we had seen the outbreak of violence against fellow Africans in our own country and the tragic failure of leadership in our neighboring Zimbabwe. But he remained a cult-like figure among many Africans for daring to challenge Western political dominance on the world's affairs. In retaliation for the measures we took to empower the black majority, the United Kingdom has mobilized uh, friends and allies in Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand to impose illegal economic sanctions against Zimbabwe. But within his own party, discontent was rising. Many believed he had overstayed and needed to hand over power. His second wife, Grace Mugabe, 40 years his junior, seemed to be gaining power, and she began accusing then-Vice President Emerson Mnangagwa of trying to oust them. Mr. Mugabe finally fired his longtime aide, accusing him of trying to topple him. Mr. Mnangagwa, with the help of the military, mounted a comeback, posting soldiers on the streets and placing Mr. Mugabe under house arrest. Tens of thousands of Zimbabweans marched, calling on him to step down. And after the threat of impeachment, he resigned. In his last years, Mr. Mugabe had retreated to the seclusion of his mansion. Many will remember him as a gifted orator and visionary who liberated Zimbabwe, but later returned her to the shackles of oppression. Shinkan Yuaka reporting. Well, Patrick Smith is the editor of the newsletter Africa Confidential, which covers politics and economics in Africa, and he joins us now from Paris. Patrick, thank you for joining us. Just tell us what the perspective is from sub-Saharan Africa on Robert Mugabe and his legacy and why? Well, I, I think as many people have said, it's a mixed one. I think there's uh, always been huge support for his role as a uh, role within the liberation movement in Southern Africa. ZANU PF was regarded uh, as the great success story initially of, of liberation struggle in Southern Africa. Uh, and then 20 years later, uh, for his campaign to lead uh, for the land re redistribution in, in, uh, in Zimbabwe. And I think that's, that's been a, a source of his, his great popularity uh, across the continent. Uh, of course, set against that is the situation within Zimbabwe itself, from the early victories in terms of extending access to education and health in Zimbabwe, we now have seen the progressive destruction of the Zimbabwean economy uh, to the extent that today you've got a, an unemployment rate in, in Zimbabwe of a, approaching 80% and all the political repression that has accompanied uh, the attempts uh, by the regime, the ruling party regime, to uh, suppress uh, political dissent. So I, th I think it, it, that, that, that is really the, 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 the style of, of the, the reaction to his demise. Uh, it's a very mixed legacy. But, but in a way, he's regarded as a liberator. How important is it the way in which 
Zimbabwe achieve black majority rule compared with other African countries? Well, uh, Mugabe himself actually said uh, the m big mistake in retrospect was actually going to, uh, to a treaty in uh, 1979, the Lancaster House Conference. He said they should have just pressed on and got total military victory. Uh, and then they could have uh, re redistributed the land at the point of getting political independence. So uh, what he was arguing was essentially what they got in 1980 was a kind of flag political independence, they didn't get economic independence, and that had to wait until he pursued land reform in, in the 2000s. And uh, again, I mean, that's, that, that's a view that has a lot of resonance today in South, uh, in South Africa, where you get the, uh, the radical of the economic freedom fighters saying exactly the same. Mandela got a political deal in 1994, but he didn't get an economic deal. And uh, that's why South Africa ha hasn't been transformed in the way that groups like the EFF want it to be. So I, th I think that's also another important legacy of the Mugabe era, that it, 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 it achieved the political independence people were demanding, but it never got the economic independence that people had been expecting as well. What are the prospects for Zimbabwe now, now that he's been out of power for some time, there's a new government in place, how different th might things be? Well, I think, uh, speaking to Zimbabwean friends this morning and getting their reaction, they said, look, you know, if this had happened, if Mugabe had died 15 years ago, it would have been seismic in terms of its political importance because there would have definitely been a power struggle within the ruling party. The opposition would have probably been emboldened. But what you've got now almost, it's, uh, it's probably disrespectful to say it's irrelevant, but essentially uh, the, the political and economic crisis, the depth of that that Zimbabwe is in at the moment, the death of Mugabe isn't going to have an immediate impact on that. It may well embolden the, uh, the opposition movements to say, well, you can't, you can't blame Mugabe now, uh, which is what some, some elements in the ruling ZANU-PF party have been trying to do, to say, well, we're, tr we're trying to, to fix things up after Mugabe's mistakes. They can't do that anymore. But it, es essentially, I think uh, the fundamental issues now are the, the economic and the political discord in the country and uh, the failure of the current government to address these issues. And I think that is where you're going to see the focus on. And, uh, that everyone's going to pay respects to Mugabe as the national founding father, but I think they're going to quickly move on to addressing the, the, the crisis, the deepening crisis that the country faces. Patrick Smith from Africa Confidential, thank you very much for your time. We've been reporting the death of Robert Mugabe, who led Zimbabwe's independence movement and became the country's president for 30 years. And the extent to which he divided opinion across Africa has been reflected in the way public figures around the world have reacted to his death at the age of 95. Mugabe's successor of pres uh, the president of Zimbabwe, Emerson Mnangagwa, has praised him as an icon of liberation. But here, the former Labour minister, Lord Haynes, said the early promise of his leadership was outweighed by corruption and repression. Paul Adams assesses reaction to Mr Mugabe's death. What happened to Robert Mugabe? How did this African liberator, fated around the world, turn into an isolated pariah, clinging to power until his former allies decided they'd had enough? I, Robert Gabriel Mugabe... It started so well, a landslide victory in 1980 amid promises of progress and racial reconciliation. That sense of early optimism reflected in some of today's reactions. Comrade Mugabe was an icon of liberation, tweeted the man who replaced him, who dedicated his life to the emancipation and empowerment of his people. His contribution will never be forgotten. And from former fellow revolutionaries in South Africa, the ANC mourns the passing of friend, statesman and revolutionary comrade Robert Mugabe. Mugabe started off as a liberation hero and somebody who was imprisoned by the old racist white minority regime of Ian Smith, tortured, not allowed to attend his son's funeral, and therefore he suffered a great deal for the cause of the liberation of, Z of Zimbabwe. But so too did the country he led. Robert Mugabe rarely shied away from the use of violence. It became a hallmark of his regime, profoundly troubling for opponents and colleagues alike.
I'm afraid we have a deeply rooted legacy of violence in this country, and you can't just blame Robert Mugabe for that. One also has to blame uh, the intransigence of Ian Smith and the Rhodesian Front in the 1960s and 1970s. But certainly Robert Mugabe perpetuated that culture of violence. It is now deeply uh, rooted in our society, and it's going to take probably another generation to, to rid the country of that legacy. Robert Mugabe ruled Zimbabwe for 37 years. Towards the end, he seemed frail, remote, exhausted. Did he simply linger too long? If uh, the late president had been a two-term president, he would have gone down in history along with the likes of Nelson Mandela. Um, I think it was a case of just over having, just having overstayed. But on the streets that still bear his name, many Zimbabweans are inclined to be more generous. He, he was my first president. So to me, he, he deserves a great honor. This is uh, sad news. We lost a good father. Mugabe was all right. When Emerson Mnangagwa took over in 2017, the country seemed euphoric. But less than two years on, hopes have once more been dashed. It's a measure, perhaps, of Zimbabwe's desperate condition that Robert Mugabe is once again seen by many as a hero. Paul Adams, BBC News. He was the liberation hero who became a ruthless dictator. Robert Mugabe, the former president of Zimbabwe, has died at the age of 95. Mr Mugabe led the independence war against white minority rule and then ruled the country for 37 years. His regime was one of brutal repression and economic mismanagement which brought Zimbabwe to its knees. He was finally overthrown in a coup and has now died in hospital in Singapore. A warning that this report from our correspondent in Zimbabwe, Shinga Nyoka, contains flash photography. He was once Zimbabwe's liberator, leading a war against white minority rule. But by the end, the adulation President Robert Mugabe once enjoyed was gone. He cemented his power, winning overwhelmingly at elections in 1980. As leader of a new nation, he set about creating a better country than the one he inherited. And for a while, he succeeded. There can never be any return to the state of armed conflict which existed before our commitment to peace and the democratic process of election under the Lancaster House Agreement. Surely, this is now time to beat our swords into plowshares. But beneath the veneer lay a dark side. Mr Mgabe deployed a crack military unit to southern Zimbabwe to deal with hundreds of insurgents. Between 1983 and 1987, thousands were murdered and the world turned a blind eye. Mugabe was the great hope. But as the 1990s ended, the economy was bottoming out and a new political party was on the rise. Seemingly desperate to regain popularity, Mr. Mugabe played a political hand. Land seized by the colonial government was still in the hands of the white minority. Sensing the frustration, Mugabe encouraged blacks to take back their land, and they did, often violently. The Western world took note, breaking diplomatic ties and imposing economic sanctions. The opposition, its leaders, human rights workers bore the brunt of his anger. In 2008, in the midst of billion percent inflation and widespread unemployment, Mr Mugabe suffered his first electoral defeat. It only led to more violence in the second round of voting. Britain stripped him of his knighthood and former allies condemned him. Nearer to home, we had seen the outbreak of violence against fellow Africans in our own country and the tragic failure of leadership in our neighboring Zimbabwe. But he remained a cult-like figure among many Africans for daring to challenge Western political dominance on the world's affairs. 
in retaliation for the measures we took to empower the black majority, the United Kingdom has mobilized uh, friends and allies in Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand to impose illegal economic sanctions against Zimbabwe. But within his own party, discontent was rising. Many believed he had overstayed and needed to hand over power. His second wife, Grace Mugabe, 40 years his junior, seemed to be gaining power, and she began accusing then Vice President Emerson Mnangagwa of trying to oust them. Mr. Mugabe finally fired his longtime aide, accusing him of trying to topple him. Mr. Mnangagwa, with the help of the military, mounted a comeback, posting soldiers on the streets and placing Mr. Mugabe under house arrest. Tens of thousands of Zimbabweans marched, calling on him to step down. And after the threat of impeachment, he resigned. In his last years, Mr. Mugabe had retreated to the seclusion of his mansion. Many will remember him as a gifted orator and visionary who liberated Zimbabwe, but later returned her to the shackles of oppression. Shingai Nyoka reporting there on the death of Robert Mugabe at the age of 95. Well, let's discuss his legacy with Julia Gallagher, who is with me, Professor of African Politics at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, part of the University of London. A very good evening to you. And just in the last few moments, in fact, while we were listening to that, uh, we hear on various news agencies that uh, Mnangagwa is just saying that the ruling ZANU-PF party has declared Robert Mugabe a national hero. Yes. What do you make of that? I don't think that's surprising at all. Uh, Mugabe is a very complicated character. Um, he created Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was defined by him for, for mo has been for most of its life, um, for its, its key years. Um, everybody who's in government was part of, part of that too. Um, and I think that despite the, the uh, depravities and miseries that were created, um, some from the beginning, in fact, even in the early years, but certainly becoming really, really quite um, obvious and, and problematic in later years. Um, there's still a feeling of, of attachment to him as a liberation hero, as a man who defined this country. And I think that uh, it would have been uh, surprising if the ruling ZANU-PF hadn't recognised that uh, uh, publicly. Um, and I'm not at all surprised that he will be uh, seen as a national hero. I'm interested that you say some of the seeds were there quite mm -hmm. early on because it's striking how many people today have effectively said the problem was he didn't know when to quit, he didn't know when to leave politics. But you're saying actually some of the, what, the brutalities even were there early on? Certainly. I mean, he, he was a man who was forged through a liberation a uh, uh, struggle through 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 a, um, a war uh, he had to fight his way to the top of the party he had to get rid of rivals he had to make sure that he was preeminent and then when he came to power there were uh, atrocities in in uh, Matabili land the Gohurundi um, uh, uh, massacres which many many people died in those and people in Matabili land don't forget those and although the West didn't sort of really clock them and although many people actually in large parts of the country refused to believe even sometimes that Mugabe knew about them he did he did and that's clear um, and so uh, that that kind of of repression was there in the early years but similarly his status as uh, a, a man who had a vision for his country a man who had a vision for post-colonial Africa for for pan-Africanism also continue to resonate even into the dire years. And so you will find in Zimbabwe even today that people will have mixed feelings about this man. It's not a clear cut thing. Pol polarizing figure. He was a polarizing figure, but he was also within Zimbabwe and within broad, more broadly within Africa, uh, an ambiguous figure, um, a man who, who people had very mixed feelings about. Um, even people in Zimbabwe who fought him and, and struggled, you know, would still recognize his towering intellect, his great skills as a politician, and his legacy of liberation for the country. And, and I do want to ask you about the country today, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the structures that must have supported him, are, are they still there? I mean, I mean the, the economic 
dire economic situation that we know about uh, is, is surely that's going to take a very, very long time to repair. They're absolutely there. And, and the, the replacement of him by Emerson Mgagwa was really a, a, a shift of personnel at the top, uh, but the, the deep structures underneath are absolutely still very much the same. It really wasn't a revolution. It really wasn't the, the exciting overturn that, that many Zimbabweans had hoped for. It's very much business as usual, but possibly business as usual with a president who's got fewer of the impressive skills that Mugabe had certainly in the earlier years. Mm, that's interesting. Very, very good to uh, have your expertise. Thanks very much indeed. Professor Julia Gallagher there from the University of London. Thank you very much. Right now we will talk more about the death of Robert Mugabe. His successor as president of Zimbabwe, Emerson Mnangagwa, has praised him as an icon of liberation. But here, the Labour Minister Lord Hayne, who was a long-time anti-apartheid campaigner, said the early promise of his leadership was outweighed by corruption and repression. Our correspondent Paul Adams has been assessing reaction to Robert Mugabe's death. What happened to Robert Mugabe? How did this African liberator, fated around the world, turn into an isolated pariah, clinging to power until his former allies decided they'd had enough? I, Robert Gabriel Mugabe... It started so well, a landslide victory in 1980 amid promises of progress and racial reconciliation. That sense of early optimism reflected in some of today's reactions. Comrade Mugabe was an icon of liberation, tweeted the man who replaced him, who dedicated his life to the emancipation and empowerment of his people. His contribution will never be forgotten. And from former fellow revolutionaries in South Africa, the ANC mourns the passing of friend, statesman and revolutionary comrade Robert Mugabe. Mugabe started off as a liberation hero and somebody who was imprisoned by the old racist white minority regime of Ian Smith, tortured, not allowed to attend his son's funeral, and therefore he suffered a great deal for the cause of the liberation of, Z of Zimbabwe. But so too did the country he led. Robert Mugabe rarely shied away from the use of violence. It became a hallmark of his regime, profoundly troubling for opponents and colleagues alike. I'm afraid we have a deeply rooted legacy of violence in this country, and you can't just blame Robert Mugabe for that. One also has to blame uh, the intransigence of Ian Smith and the Rhodesian Front in the 1960s and 1970s. But certainly Robert Mugabe perpetuated that culture of violence. It is now deeply uh, rooted in our society, and it's going to take probably another generation to, to rid the country of that legacy. Robert Mugabe ruled Zimbabwe for 37 years. Towards the end, he seemed frail, remote, exhausted. Did he simply linger too long? If uh, the late president had been a two-term president, he would have gone down in history along with the likes of Nelson Mandela. Um, I think it was a case of just over having, just having overstayed. But on the streets that still bear his name, many Zimbabweans are inclined to be more generous. He was my first president. So to me, he deserves a great honor. This is uh, sad news. We lost a good father. Mugabe was all right. When Emerson Mnangagwa took over in 2017, the country seemed euphoric. But less than two years on, hopes have once more been dashed. It's a measure, perhaps, of Zimbabwe's desperate condition that Robert Mugabe is once again seen by many as a hero. Paul Adams, BBC News. That report by uh, Shingai Nyoka following the death of President Robert Mugabe. Well, let's go to our correspondent, Milton Nkosi, who's been getting the reaction in Johannesburg in South Africa uh, and not just South Africa Milton great to see you by the way um, regionally how was Mugabe uh, viewed Robert Mugabe was viewed uh, in, a, in very different ways by many people uh, they saw a man who was a tyrant who was a dictator who brought misery to millions of people remember that in south africa there's an estimated of two uh, to four million zimbabweans 
who have fled their own country, their economic decline there, looking for job opportunities here. And that is what a lot of people are talking about today. But there are some who remember a liberator, the man who freed them from white minority rule oppression. Remember that Robert Mugabe spent 10 years in prison fighting the white minority rule government of Ian Smith in the then Rhodesia. And he was even denied the uh, right to bury his own son at the time. And he became president. He set up an amazing education system from which millions of Zimbabweans are still benefiting today. So uh, a mixed uh, bag of uh, the reaction to Robert Mugabe's death today. Uh, Milton, many people are asking the question, what on earth went wrong? Why would he turn on his own people? And, and some analysts are pointing to his treatment in prison in Harare. Um, as you said, the death of his young son and the refusal to attend his funeral. His treatment in prison, not spoken of, but uh, pretty key. And the death of his first wife. What went wrong? He became increasingly bitter as he grew older and he clung on to power for too long and in the end he uh, got to a point where he was not making progress. He spent the better part of the first decade of his presidency doing very well in Zimbabwe. They were exporting grain, tobacco and many other commodities uh, across the continent and across uh, the world. But uh, he soon got into that land redistribution program after he lost in a, a referendum and uh, he started the campaign of grabbing land from white farmers. From then on, things uh, didn't go right for Robert Mugabe, and he just dug in, and that is what really created uh, the situation he ended up in. The very story that he, as a former president of Zimbabwe, dies in a hospital in Singapore, that itself tells you the gravity of what's happened in that country. And finally, Milton, what, you know, there has been the accusation that so many key characters um, from the um, Mugabe era just turned a blind eye. Um, just thinking about his cohorts for the, for the liberation struggle, I'm thinking Kenneth Kaunda, I'm thinking Nelson Mandela. How did they regard him as things went wrong? Well, people did speak out. I remember Archbishop Desmond Tutu spoke out and Nelson Mandela said there was a lack of leadership from across the Limpopo River in Zimbabwe. There were many critics, but they were doing it in a very subtle way. When the West was coming out openly and uh, in a more sort of defiant way, criticizing Robert Mugabe, there was a time when Robert Mugabe here in a conference in Johannesburg in 2002, where he told the former Prime Minister uh, when he said, Tony Blair, keep your England and let me keep my Zimbabwe. And that gave a lot of pan-Africanists, people who had been tired of colonial rule, a bit of confidence that here's a man who's fighting for Africa's liberation. So that is how Robert Mugabe is remembered and that's how he was treated by the leaders. But today, the official statements, even from President Cyril Ramaphosa, a great man has died, a great leader has died, and that's how uh, he is remembered officially. Okay, Milton, um, we'll see more of this, of course, uh, when the funeral takes place. But for now, thank you very much. That report was by Shingai Nyoka. Well, earlier, the former Labour minister and anti-apartheid uh, campaigner, Lord Peter Hayne, gave his reaction to the death of Robert Mugabe. Mugabe began well. He promised to bring everybody together after a racist white minority rule in the old Rhodesia that he'd helped liberate. And so I and many others were thrilled when he was elected. But then later, he became corrupt, self-serving, despotic, unleashing violence and terror against anybody who didn't agree with him, rigging elections, and at the same time bankrupting his country and ruining and ruining a rich agricultural sector to the point where they had to import food. A really disastrous record. 
That was Lord Peter Hain there. Well, the Zimbabwean author Douglas Rogers uh, joins us now. He wrote two books about Robert Mugabe and also uh, experiences, his experiences of the country. Thank you for speaking to us um, this evening here on BBC News. What did you think when the news first broke? Um, well, it wasn't much of a surprise. He was um, 95 years old, very frail. Um, he was uh, running out of time for the number, last number of years. Um, but uh, neither am I dancing on anyone's grave. I, th I think that's uh, it's, it's not the right time for that. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that I died in a state-of-the-art hospital in Singapore, getting the finest medical treatment in the world, and um, back home his country is on life support. Um, I wonder if you could explain to viewers, Douglas, um, you've lived in the country, you understand the ways, um, why there has been so much respect that's been given to a man who has been described as a despot and a dictator. We're hearing a lot about the phrase of uh, Ubuntu. Well, uh, Mugabe, of course, was the, the leader of the, uh, the liberation movement that uh, won independence from minority white rule. Um, and for a number of years, for the first decade, I'd say 15 years possibly, um, he did uh, impressive things in Zimbabwe. Um, the record was patchy in those early years, but um, Zimbabwe's literacy, it had a, a, a thriving economy, a good healthcare system, and was for many years the model post-colonial African country. Um, and I think there's the legacy, obviously, of Liberation War, but the memory of that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, defeat colonial rule. Your memoirs were called uh, the, the, the Last Resort and they've been described as a, a moving testament to the love and loyalty inspired by Zimbabwe and her people. Why do you think there was, and still is to a certain degree, a great love for Zimbabwe? Tell us about the potential that the country never quite reached. Well, um, Mugabe died in Singapore um, and uh, Zimbabwe could have been the Singapore of Africa. Um, it has uh, far greater resources than Singapore does. Um, it uh, has, as I mentioned earlier, a highly literate population, very educated. Um, and anyone who visits Zimbabwe falls in love with it, um, it mostly with its people, but obviously its, its beautiful landscape. Um, but if you were to go to Zimbabwe now, um, you would struggle to get electricity. Obviously, the economy is in a shambles, and the country is incredibly fractious and divided in a way it wasn't um, 15, 20 years ago. Douglas, what was it like in the early days when Mugabe first took power? And at what point did it change and what did it do to your family? Well, I've, I was very young at uh, independence in 1980. Um, I was 12 years old. Um, I do recall a, a speech Mugabe made uh, when he won that election in 1980. Um, a lot of white uh, Rhodesians fled the country over the next few years, fearing a dictatorship um, and Marxism. And I remember he made an incredible speech on national television, um, basically about reconciliation and if I fought you as an enemy, you are now my friend. That was one of the reason my, reasons my parents stayed in the country. Um, but 20 years later, Mugabe turned his his guns on them, on people like them, and on uh, his political opponents who, after 20 years, had uh, had enough of his rule. When you say turned his guns on them, what happened? What was the experience? Well, in 2000, if you recall, he, he lost a referendum to change the constitution. and It was the first uh, election uh, national vote that he'd ever lost. And his response, his response, always Mugabe's response was to find an enemy. Uh, he never took responsibility uh, for any problems in the country, uh, for corruption, for misrule. Um, so he always found an enemy. And in the 2000, he uh, he found uh, he started using um, colonial rule, uh, white farmers, white landowners. He started to blame them for the country's problems. Really, he was going after black farm workers who were supporting the opposition. Um, but as you'll know, in 2000 was the beginning of the land invasions. Uh, commercial farms were taken and the beginning of the country's uh, rapid decline, economic decline, um, the onset of hyperinflation, um, the collapse of agriculture um, and isolation. Um, what hopes do you have for Zimbabwe now? Would you ever go back? I visit a lot. My, my, my father still lives there. I've got a lot of family there. I, lo I love visiting Zimbabwe. Uh, the, best, the best people in the world. And um, 
there is, uh, again, a lot of people th say things haven't changed in Zimbabwe. Mugabe was removed from power, um, ironically, by his former comrades um, in 2017. Um, but as anyone knows, the economic situation in Zimbabwe has not improved. Um, it's as divided as ever. Um, we can only hope through people who are um, uh, generally like some of the most welcoming and smartest and brightest people um, can put it back on its feet. Um, but one of the tragedies, of course, is three or four million people live outside the country, in South Africa, in the UK. Um, there is a great irony is uh, how many Zimbabweans work in the, for the National Health Service in Britain, and um, that's because they can't find uh, jobs, careers in Zimbabwe. It, it did lo lose all its um, people wealth, didn't it? Douglas Rogers, thank you very much for your time and your, your reflections. Thank you. Thank you. Your Bureau, let's talk about the other big story of the day. That's the former, former president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, has died in Singapore, where he'd been receiving medical treatment. He was 95 years old. Mr. Mugabe was Zimbabwe's first leader after the country gained independence from Britain back in 1980. But by the late 1990s, his rule was defined by an economic crisis marked by high interest rates, inflation, and later the seizure of white-owned farms to resettle black farmers. Okay. Okay, let's get more. Milton and Cozy is our South Africa business correspondent and joins us from Johannesburg. Milton, always lovely to see you as well, my friend. Uh, I think it's fair to say you know, today the Zimbabwean economy is still a bit of a basket case. Uh, inflation, I think, in June was 175%. But when Robert Mugabe was in power, something like in his first 15 or so years, this was the most diversified economy in Africa, and certainly it was the breadbasket. Oh yes, uh, at that time uh, Zimbabwe was even exporting uh, materials, particularly tobacco and uh, grain um, across the region and other parts of the world. Robert Mugabe had set up a fantastic education system which is still beneficial to millions of Zimbabweans who are this side of the Limpopo River here in South Africa looking for uh, a better economic uh, life. Uh, it is believe that uh, between two and four million Zimbabweans are in South Africa and they're being hired uh, partly because they come from that very rich education system set up by Robert Mugabe in those early years. Mm. And can I ask you then, so it leads us to go, what went wrong? We know there was the confiscation, if you will, of the white farmland. Was that, was that a, a, a given to black farmers? Was that mishandled? But was it also a combination of... Um, of uh, you know what are many of the countries around the the west were were doing sanctions for example on zimbabwe Yes, indeed. The donors who, were, who had agreed that they would fund the land redistribution program started complaining that uh, in Zimbabwe that land distribution is now uh, covered by cronism. In other words, they were saying that the money that they were giving to the government to buy land from white farmers was then uh, uh, buying farmers, uh, farms for the elite, for people who were close to Robert Mugabe and uh, they stopped that funding and that's what created a, a gulf between Robert Mugabe and the donors and then politically he, he clung to power at a time when he had been in power for a long time and that affected the economy in Zimbabwe quite uh, badly. Indeed it did. Milton and Cozy, always a pleasure. You have a lovely weekend as well and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks very much for joining us live there Same. from Johannesburg. Uh, let's just touch on... Hello, this is Impact, bringing you all the day's top stories and later in the programme, more news in depth. I'm Tim Wilcox. Liberation hero or ruthless dictator, Zimbabwe's former president Robert Mugabe is dead at 95. He is our former president and he liberated us from the colonists as well as giving us land. He was a dictator to others, he was a hero to others, so uh, he has done a lot for other people, but other people think he was a bad guy. We'll have global reaction to his death and consider his legacy for Africa and indeed the rest of the world. Also coming up on Impact.
Hello, welcome to the programme. We are live for the next 30 minutes. You can give me your views at BBC Tim Wilcox. A liberation hero and tiring figure in African history, or a ruthless dictator who turned his country into a pariah state and led his people into poverty. Two views of one man, Robert Mugabe, the former president of Zimbabwe, who has died at the age of 95. Mugabe led the independence war against white minority rule in what was then Rhodesia, but when he took power he brought economic ruin to a country rich in resources. Thousands of his opponents were murdered. After 37 years in power, he was finally overthrown in a soft coup. That was in 2017. Well, he died in hospital in Singapore, where he'd been treated for several months. From Zimbabwe, our correspondent Shinga Nioka reports. He was once Zimbabwe's liberator, leading a war against white minority rule. But by the end, the adulation President Robert Mugabe once enjoyed was gone. He cemented his power, winning overwhelmingly at elections in 1980. As leader of a new nation, he set about creating a better country than the one he inherited. And for a while, he succeeded. There can never be any return to the state of armed conflict which existed before our commitment to peace and the democratic process of election under the Lancaster House Agreement. Surely, this is now time to beat our swords into plowshares. But beneath the veneer lay a dark side. Mr Mgabe deployed a crack military unit to southern Zimbabwe to deal with hundreds of insurgents. Between 1983 and 1987, thousands were murdered and the world turned a blind eye. In 2008, in the midst of billion percent inflation and widespread unemployment, Mr Mugabe suffered his first electoral defeat. It only led to more violence in the second round of voting. Britain stripped him of his knighthood, but he remained a cult-like figure among many Africans for daring to challenge Western political dominance on the world's affairs. But within his own party, discontent was rising. Many believed he had overstayed and needed to hand over power. His second wife, Grace Mugabe, 40 years his junior, seemed to be gaining power, and she began accusing then-Vice President Emerson Mnangagwa of trying to oust them. Mr Mugabe finally fired his longtime aide, accusing him of trying to topple him. Mr Mnangagwa, with the help of the military, mounted a comeback, posting soldiers on the streets and placing Mr Mugabe under house arrest. Tens of thousands of Zimbabweans marched, calling on him to step down. And after the threat of impeachment, he resigned. In his last years, Mr Mugabe had retreated to the seclusion of his mansion. Many will remember him as a gifted orator and visionary who liberated Zimbabwe, but later returned her to the shackles of oppression. Well, I've been talking to our correspondent Milton and Cozy in Johannesburg, and he gave us the reaction from there. You're watching Impact on BBC World News. A reminder of our main story, the former president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, has died at the age of 95. He led his country to independence in 1980, but his 37-year rule was marked by economic collapse and human rights abuses. Well, let's uh, speak now to the Zimbabwean author, journalist and former human rights lawyer, uh, Peter Godwin. 95 years old, do you accept that when he first took power, he was a force for good? Um, kind of. I mean, I think the thing about Mugabe is that everybody, the, the, the way that we're, that we're projecting him now is that he was a good leader turned bad. And actually, if you look at his political DNA, he was using violence right from the beginning and it served him well. In, in what way was that violence shown? Though? I, I'm, I'm looking across the board now in terms of the fact that he was a, that he was a, 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 a freedom fighter. He fought against, obviously, uh, UDI in, in what was then Rhodesia. When you look at his education policies, when you look at this idea of trying to bring uh, society together, did he not advocate that quite successfully? He did. I mean, I suppose what I'm referring to is the fact that um, both in early ZANU-PF leadership struggles, that it was very violent. 
that his struggle against white rule was violent, albeit morally, morally um, worth doing and you know, successful, that he then was very violent in, in Matsubili land in the early 1980s in Gokurahundi and the Matsubili land massacres. And he then used violence against political opponents when he, once he'd established a one-party state. And then he used violence again to clear, the, to clear land. So in that sense, you have an underpinning of violence all the way through. And I think Mugabe was always much more interested in power than he was in democracy. Without any redeeming features at all? No, he, I mean, l listen, health and education early on were, were successes. Um, there's, there's no getting away from that, and, and one, one should acknowledge that. But I think that the, the problem was that, you know, Mugabe was much more consistent, and, and certainly whenever he faced any sort of challenge to his authority. Uh, so all I'm trying to say is that he was very consistent. What happened was that the world changed in a number of ways. It changed in 1990 in particular, when, when Nelson Mandela came out of prison and apartheid started to crumble, and also at the end of the Cold War, and that changed everything for Mugabe. You, you lived there, you returned there, uh, I think with family members, your, your sister, uh, you, you wrote a book about fear, the last days of Robert Mugabe, when you thought he, his days were numbered back in uh, 2008. Just describe what you had seen over the decades of how Zimbabwe had been taken from this abundant, wealthy uh, nation to uh, a country with what, at one stage, I think a billion percent inflation. I mean, you know, in some senses, any tragedy uh, is measured against the potential of a country. And in that regard, Zimbabwe is an enormous tragedy. It was once the wealthiest country in, in Africa. It was once indeed the most literate, the most educated, with this abundant mixed economy. It could have been absolutely amazing. And now it's pretty much one of the poorest countries in Africa. Its people have a very low um, lifespan. And I think there's something very, I mean, more than ironic that, you know, Mugabe dies in a luxury private Singaporean clinic um, when eventually they take him off life support when his country, Zimbabwe, is still very much on life support. How, how complicit do you think is the rest of the African continent for not confronting Mugabe uh, in the last 30 or 40 years? Here's a very interesting thing about the way Mugabe is portrayed in Africa. The further away you get from Zimbabwe, the more popular he gets. The people who actually lived under him, his own people, subject people, and I use that word advisedly, uh, you know, have been trying to get rid of him for a long time, the majority of them. Um, but once you get away from Zimbabwe, he has got sort of pan-African credentials from people who've never actually had to suffer under his misrule. So there are these two different and, in a sense, dueling uh, images of Mugabe, reputations, if you like, and they, and they are defined by distance from him. And on this, the, the, the day he, he's died, I mean, what, what are your final thoughts about him? What, what in your view, uh, is his legacy? You know, I've spent decades documenting the, the, the people who have, um, who have been subject to the violence that he's meted out, and it has been an extraordinary thing to see, and I'm afraid I don't feel any, any sorrow at his passing at all. I mean, the only thing that I'm sorry about, in a sense, is that he managed to hand on uh, the reins to his, to his number two, who's, who's essentially Emerson Monongagwa, and in that sense, this regime will continue. Peter Godwin, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us here on BBC World News. Hello, this is BBC World News with me, Karen Giannone. Our top stories, African leaders pay tribute to Robert Mugabe, who's died aged 95. He's praised for his leadership of the independence struggle, but others say Zimbabweans suffered too long under his rule. He is our former president and he liberated us from the colonists as well as given us land. He was a dictator to others, he was a hero to others, so uh, he has done a lot for other people but other people think he was a bad guy. Hello, welcome to BBC World News. 
Shingai Nyoko with that report. Well, Robert Mugabe died in the hospital in Singapore where he'd been treated for several months. Our correspondent Karishma Vazwani has the latest from there. I'm standing in front of the prestigious and exclusive Glen Eagles Hospital here in Singapore, which is where it's thought that Robert Mugabe spent uh, a fair amount of time, in fact, the last few months of his life. He was frequently spotted here, receiving medical treatment for a condition uh, that we don't know at this point. But he also had links to Singapore. One of his children, his daughter, graduated from a private university here, and he was spotted at that graduation photograph there. His wife, Grace Mugabe, often accompanied him on these trips, and she was also seen in some of Singapore's most expensive shopping districts, carrying lots of shopping bags. Now, it's not clear what condition he died of, but the Singapore Health Science Authority has told the BBC that there was no coroner or police at his death, which appears to suggest that he may well have died of natural causes. At this point in time, the Singapore government is keeping rather tight-lipped about his death, but that's understandable given that he was such a high-profile figure in international politics. Karishma Vasmani. Hello, this is BBC World News. I'm Karen Ginoni. Our top stories, African leaders pay tribute to Robert Mugabe, who's died aged 95. He's praised for his leadership of the independent struggle, but others say Zimbabweans suffered too long under his rule. He is our former president, and he liberated us from the colonists, as well as given us land. He was a dictator to others, he was a hero to others, so uh, he has done a lot for other people, but other people think he was a bad guy. Hello, welcome to BBC World News. Let's take you straight to the Zimbabwean capital Harare and the State House there where President Emerson Menangagwa is giving a statement to the nation. The death early this morning in Singapore of the founder of our nation and iconic leader of a struggle for national liberation Comrade Robert Gabe Mugabe leaves a big void in our nation. A veteran nationalist and a dot pan Africanist fighter, Comrade Mugabe bequeaths a rich and indelible legacy of tenacious adherence to principle on the collective rights of Africa and Africans in general, and in particular, the rights of the people of Zimbabwe for whom he gave his all to help free. In his life and the political career, met and melded key phases, moods and shifts in the story of our national struggle and a quest for freedom and statehood, including the tragedies, tragedies, pains and rigors which underwrote that epic story. Incarcerated for 11 years in settler colonial prisons, he, alongside fellow nationalists, who included late Father Zimbabwe, Comrade Joshua Mkabuko Nkomo, remained and bold and resolute, eventually escaping from the then Rhodesia in 1974 in order to lead and guide the resumption and escalation of our war of liberation at a time of its tragic setbacks and paralysis. Before long, and under his firm leadership, the struggle regained momentum, expanded and consolidated, transforming the patriotic front into a formidable 
coordinated national liberation movement and a fighting force capable of waging one of the most grueling and protracted struggles in the South African region. Today, our country is free. It has been since 1980, thanks to the sacrifices of a generation of dedicated veteran nationalists and freedom fighters predating the 1960s who included the late comrade Mugabe. A great teacher and a mentor the bitterness of long spells in incarceration and the anguish of a brutal and a bitter war never extinguished Comrade Mugabe's forgiving inner humanity. That humanity shone and diminished throughout that season of war and forcefully asserted itself by way of the signature policy of national reconciliation on which our whole statehood was founded and built. Through that policy of forgiveness, Southern African politics took a definitive shift towards a just post-conflict multiracial harmony, which would be replicated elsewhere in our region and beyond. He thus wrote a lasting purge on nation building and statecraft for the world, making him stand out as such a remarkable statesman of our century. <clears throat> Apart from landmark post-independence transformations in areas of rights, education, social services for the hitherto marginalized black Zimbabweans, the late departed icon will be eternally remembered and honored for the bold and historic land reform program which he undertook. Through this program, Indigenous Zimbabweans regained their long-denied land rights to complete their sovereignty. For that, he was especially vilified, shunned, and punished by those who stood to lose from an end to colonial rights and from a just reassertion of African rights. With characteristic defiance, he stood firm and undaunted, resolutely pressing on, on with the land reform program to completion, all against formidable odds, which included punitive sanctions and other reprisals that followed and which still dog us to this day. Today, Zimbabwe's land question itself a principal grievance of our struggle stands fully and irrevocably addressed and resolved. History will remember him for this bold move. As we mourn the passing on of our commander, liberator, founder and leader, we remain determined to carry forward the transformation he so fervently desired, including protecting and defending the gains of the struggle for which he made huge sacrifices. On the bedrock and the solid foundation of the First Republic, which he molded as its leader, we today recover and grow our economy, brick by brick, 
until his lifelong vision of an empowered people is realized. On behalf of our nation, that of my family, and on my own behalf, I wish to express my deepest heartfelt condolences to the Mugabe family, to my Grace Mugabe, and the children especially, on this their saddest loss. I, my Mugabe, stood by a husband to the very end, thus imparting to our nation a lasting lesson on devout love and care. For that, we deeply thank her as we join her in the grief of loss and bereavement, which is also ours to feel and bear. ZANPF, the party which the late departed held found, has met and accorded him national hero status, which he and and richly deserves. Let me also register the gratitude of government and our entire nation to the government and people of the Republic of Singapore for the unmatched hospitality and the medical care they extended to our leader up to the very end. In particular, we are most grateful to the team of medical experts and support staff which cared for him with, with such great diligence, dedication and compassion. They did all they could up to the very end. As we await the arrival of the remains of our dear departed icon, we pray that the good Lord grant him mercies, putting his dear soul to eternal rest. We as Zimbabweans declare days of mourning for our leader until he is buried. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you well, that is much, uh, Zimbabwe's President Emerson Menengagwa a long-time ally of President Mugabe, paying a glowing tribute, recalling uh, Robert Mugabe as an in a liberation hero of the independence struggle, the founder of the National Liberation Movement, talking about uh, how our country is free today, it has been since 1980, a very uncritical and loyal tribute to Robert Mugabe, uh, glowing talking about him as a great teacher, a remarkable statesman of our century. He also talked about how he would be eternally remembered and honoured for the bold land reform program, that highly controversial land reform program that the country undertook and said he'd been vilified, shunned and punished by those who stood to lose from the end of colonial rights. We will have uh, plenty more on the death of Robert Mugabe in uh, the next edition of, Outside of uh, BBC World News and the focus on Africa in the next hour or so. Now, the former president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, has died in Singapore, where he'd been receiving medical treatment. He was 95. Now, Mr. Mugabe was Zimbabwe's first leader after the country gained independence from Britain in 1980. But by the late 1990s, his rule was defined by an economic crisis marked by high interest rates, inflation, and later, the seizure of white-owned farms to resettle black farmers. Now, Milton Nkosi is our South Africa correspondent and he joins us from Johannesburg. There was a lot of hope when Robert Mugabe first took office. Uh, what kind of high hopes did, he ha did people have for the economy? Apologies there, we have lost sound, so we're going to try and reestablish that. Actually, let's try that again. Robert, can you, uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me right now? Milton. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear, Samira. Can you see me? Can you hear me? We've got it all under control. Thank you very much. So I want to start by asking, you know, when he took power, uh, it started out quite well with everyone having a lot of high hopes for the economy. 
Yes, indeed. It was a time of independence, a post-colonial time in 1980 when Robert Mugabe took over the reins of power in Zimbabwe. There was a lot of hope and indeed he delivered on that hope. He set up a fantastic education system uh, from which many Zimbabweans up to now are still benefiting. And also he set up a good health system. At that time he didn't have to go to Singapore for any health treatment. And in fact the idea that he died in Singapore in itself as a leader leader or former leader of Zimbabwe dying in a Singaporean hospital, that in itself tells you how bad things had become in Zimbabwe after those very good years when Robert Mugabe was in charge of a thriving economy in the first year of his reign. But soon after that, in the late 1990s, things went really badly wrong when he embarked on his land redistribution program, when he invaded white-only farms, and at that point production went down down and things have never really recovered. They are battling now to try and bring that economy back. For instance, this year they are expecting at least about 5.2% of contraction. So given that mixed bag, how will he be remembered by economists? Economists and the people of Zimbabwe will remember Robert Mugabe's legacy as a mixed bag. Many people will remember him as a liberator, a person who told the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, keep your England, let me keep my Zimbabwe. That gave them a lot of confidence. It looked like it was part of an African renaissance of some sort. But there are many who remember the tyrant, the dictator, the man who abused uh, many people in Zimbabwe, particularly those in the opposition. And so uh, it's a mess back here in South Africa. The unemployment is about 28 percent and there are plus minus two to four million Zimbabweans working here who are looking for better economic opportunities because Robert Mugabe's policies in Zimbabwe brought that economy into sharp decline. Milton, just very briefly, what's the reaction been like? The reaction has been subdued, uh, unlike uh, when Nelson Mandela died here in 2013, for instance. So people are not out in the streets, outpouring of grief. It's been very subdued. A lot of people have expressed their feelings uh, about the passing of Robert Mugabe as a great liberator and, of course, others thinking of him as a tyrant and a dictator. Uh, Milton Nkosi, thank you so much for your time. That was very insightful. That was Milton Nkosi joining us there. Uh, so we You're watching BBC World News with me, Karen Giannone. The latest headlines. Robert Mugabe, the man who delivered independence for Zimbabwe but went on to become its dictator, has died at the age of 95. Well, in the past hours, Zimbabwe's current president, Emerson Menangagwa, has been paying tribute to Robert Mugabe, describing him as a great teacher, mentor and statesman. The death early this morning in Singapore of the founder of our nation and iconic leader of our struggle for national liberation, Comrade Robert Gabe Mugabe, leaves a big void in our nation. A veteran nationalist and a dot pan-Africanist fighter, Comrade Mugabe bequeathes a rich and indelible legacy of tenacious adherence to principle on the collective rights of Africa and Africans in general and in particular, the rights of the people of Zimbabwe for whom he gave his all to help free. Zimbabwe's pre current president, Emerson Menengagel. Well, joining me now is BBC's World Affairs editor, John Simpson. John, uncritical, glowing praise there. That's to be expected almost. Well, I, I think it is to a certain extent. After all, uh, Mr. Menengagel was um, the... Uh, chosen successor of Mr. Mugabe. I mean, he didn't, Robert Mugabe didn't want to go at all, but uh, he was the man that followed him most closely. I mean, it would be uh, even more grotesque, I suppose, if he 
uh, now attacked Mugabe for what he'd done, having been so loyal and faithful a, a, a supporter of his for years and years. But I don't think that this is what history is going to say about Robert Mugabe. I think this is a party political uh, line that Mnangagwa has taken. In that statement we heard from Emerson Mnangagwa, he singled out the land reform program. He said that Robert Mugabe will be eternally remembered and honoured for it. It was bold, that he was vilified and shunned by those who stood to lose from the end of colonial rights. I mean, just tell us about that land reform and how very controversial it was. Well, I mean, it started really in the late 90s when pressure on Mugabe was growing to step down but a lot of political criticism of him and he felt that within his own party, ZANU-PF, and within the country in general, uh, he was starting to be in serious danger, his position was. And uh, so he, um, rather characteristically, I'm afraid, uh, chose um, a way out which would distract attention from himself and his position. And that was to uh, get the mostly young kids, really, from uh, ZANU-PF's uh, youth wing to go and uh, take over the, the, the farms of, of white farmers. Not all of them, but a, a significant number of them. And uh, that is what, what happened. There was a certain amount of violence. I mean, not, not as much as the had been in Matabili land some years earlier when Mugabe uh, destroyed perhaps 20,000 people uh, uh, in Matabili land. But nevertheless, um, th there, were, there were some, uh, some deaths and some, uh, a lot of injuries. And of course, uh, the result was the utter collapse of the Zimbabwean economy. Uh, I was there in 2008. Um, and uh, the BBC was banned, but I, I managed to get in there. And um, the uh, rate of inflation year on year, that stage in 2008, was 89 sextillion percent. I mean, that's, I think that's, that's 21 zeros. I, I went to have a meal, and the price went up four times during the meal. And it was, it was insanity, and that was all directly due to Robert Mugabe. And the economy hasn't really recovered even now, and it's still at rock-bottom level. Many today are talking about how he started, uh, what a time of optimism that was, what he gave to Zimbabwe, and talking about what went wrong. How do you view that? Well, when he started, he did indeed uh, seem to be uh, quite forgiving um, uh, and uh, to have the, the sense that uh, Zimbabwe belonged to all its inhabitants. Um, and of course, he had, he had defeated, essentially defeated the white run government and uh, he was in a very strong position. He had great support from Britain and, and uh, the United States and other, and other Western countries. Um, and, and yet, uh, again, his, he wanted to, to dominate politics there. He had been heavily um, challenged by the Ndebele people, uh, led by Joshua Nkomo, and uh, so he sent his forces in to carry out uh, appalling atrocities there. And so uh, within a few, a few years of saying these very positive things, he was doing the absolute reverse. And yet the world kept pretty much quiet about it. John, thank you very much. John Simpson, our World Affairs Editor.